Good morning and thank you for having made it to today's uh, webinar session. My name is Tati Logutu. I'm the head of research at Dengue's Capital Investment Bank. Uh, we'll, I'll take you to the equities and fixed income, and then Mark Lee will join in later with the global market segment. I'll start with the top down what happened last week from the macroeconomic perspective, and then I'll do, then go to the equities and then finish with fixed income before inviting Mark to take over the global market segment. So starting with the macroeconomic update over the course of last week, we saw the shilling weakening to multi-year levels of around 107.47. Uh, it's our pro estimates for third quarter as per our report that we put out uh, sometime early, last, uh, early this month was that we are looking at 107.5 uh, levels by the end of the quarter. So already we are seeing these uh, levels uh, already been met within uh, under a month. Uh, but broadly, we are saying that the SX reserves are quite adequate. Uh, it's, it's at around $9.7 billion, and we don't see any external debt obligation in the near term within the quarter. On the other hand, we've been seeing that uh, CBK has been mopping up uh, excess liquidity. There's been high liquidity in the market, Broadly stemming from the fact that uh, we don't see that banks have been lending in this uncertain environment. So most of the banks are with the excess uh, uh, liquidity, which now CBK, the central bank has been coming up to mop, and that primarily should be supportive of the Kenya shilling. Uh, but we think that even the weakness has broadly been on account of some elevated uh, demand by some of the corporates. It's not, uh, this is outside the cyclical end of month uh, demand that actually comes from the corporate. So, but by and large, we still see that this shilling weakness is quite transitory. I'm uh, moving on to another thing that caught our eye last week was on, was, was, was the, uh, ordinary revenue for the fiscal year that ended last month. Uh, we saw that uh, the amount that was collected overall for ordinary revenue was 1.575 trillion shillings. This was 40 billion shy of the target. And we are seeing that for the month of June, the collection was around 123.5 billion. Our projections was at 117.5 billion. So that collection actually slightly surpassed our projections. Uh, we are seeing that on aggregate for the second quarter, that for the period between April to June, collections was 21% lower than the collections created in the similar period last year. Of course, this is because of the COVID-19 fallout where we see that there's been a hit on consumption, investment, and uh, trade, and it has an impact on collections. This somehow solidifies our view that there could be a possible contraction in the GDP in the second quarter period, which the data will be released at the end of September. So now coming down to the equities, a recap of last week, we saw the Nairobi Oil Index decline slightly. Nairobi NC20 share edged up slightly 0.4%. And on the other hand, we saw turnover declining close to 20%. To 3.43 billion in the course of last week. We saw profit taking by foreign investors, foreign investors uh, account for significant trading within the NC, uh, mainly on the big uh, counters, the big Vacom, equity, BAT, KCB, EABL. We saw the American tobacco kicking off the first half and the streak with positive 6% uh, growth on, the, on its bottom line. It also announced an interim dividend of uh, 3 shillings and 50 cents uh, with the book closure slated to be on the 21st of next month and came on the 18th of September. Uh, for this week, with uh, outlook and also our, <coughs> sorry about this, and also our outlook on the, and also trade recommendation, it stems also on our third quarter report that we put out. That's the, the one that's showing currently. We published it on the 9th of July. 
So broadly, we were more positive on uh, companies which are for trust balance sheets, uh, which we are seeing will enable them to read the storm uh, in the COVID-19 storm, still an uncertainty, but we're quite positive on those companies that have for trust balance sheets. Uh, we were actually seeing bargain entry levels on KCB, EABL, ABSA, COP, COP Bank, Cooperative Bank, Kenjen, and also to some extent Safaricom. For this week's uh, trade recommendations, we are seeing uh, entry levels at KCB at the current levels of 34 shillings and 30 shillings. The attractive multiples, it has a dividend yield of 10 shillings of 10% further, we service the sector, the banking sector, which is at 8%. Its uh, return on equity is at 20.7%, while the sector is at 16.9%. In addition to that, we also were looking at uh, some of the trades that are uh, out, of, out of consensus trades, whereby for this week, we are looking at Williamson T. Williamson T. Williamson T, together with Capture Wati, announced uh, full year earnings for the year ending March in the course of the week last week, whereby we, whereby it announced a dividend of uh, 20 shillings, which is a dividend yield of 14.6% with a book closure on the 18th of August, and uh, also together with Capture Rua, but we are quite more bullish about Williamson T, its dividend, and most of the investors currently are looking at uh, stocks which are paying dividends as some of the other strong pointers. Uh, moving on to the fixed income, uh, last week the secondary market declined uh, to the tune of 18% to 11.6 billion. Most of the trades that were executed were on the infrastructure bonds. These are bonds which do not pay, uh, which are tax exempt, so they are quite attractive in the current environment. And together, the infrastructure bond, we are looking at also the 10-year segment, 10-year segment which attracted most of the trades that were executed. For this week, uh, definitely, is uh, we are having the July 2020 primary bond turn, which will be on the on Wednesday this week. We are seeing primarily uh, the market in the in in the environment, the market is quite liquid, whereby even it has impacted uh, positively on the TBL segment, though the yields have slightly come off. Uh, we have five year, 10 year, and 15 year papers which have reopened for this uh, month's uh, primary bond option. Uh, our recommended trades are 10.7%, uh, 10.8% on the five year. 11.85% uh, to 11.95% in the 10 year, and 10.35% to 12.45% on the 15 year. We are seeing uh, most because of the high liquidity and because of the uncertain environment, most of the most of the demand has actually been on the short end of the curve, whereby between five years and below, that's where most of the demand in the bonds are actually concentrated. But so we are seeing concentration uh, of a subscription on the five-year paper, uh, but investors can also look at the 10-year paper, but now uh, with an aim not to hold to maturity, but just to match within the investment horizon. So because of the overcrowding in the five-year, investors actually look at the 10-year space, where we're seeing that the prices are not as elevated as at the five-year space, and so they can get into the 10 year, but with a lower uh, investment zone than the 10 years, and it's also less crowded. Let me leave it at that, and I can uh, can meet up with the same with dealing with the global markets. Thank you very much, Churchill. Just bear with me one second. I'm just going to share my screen to everybody. with me one moment. Okay, welcome everybody. It's our first week ahead briefing and thank you all for joining. 
My name is Mark Lee. I'm a senior trader at Equity Group and a market analyst here at FX Pacer. And hopefully this is the first webinar in many in this collaboration between FX Pacer and Genghis Capital. So this morning, I'm going to identify a few key aspects for the trading week ahead. I'm going to concentrate primarily on the economic calendar. So I like to think of economic data as a blank canvas each month. Every bit of data released is a piece of that economic puzzle or related in some way, shape or form. As traders, we concentrate primarily on what's referred to as three star data. So the most potent events on that economic calendar, the largest pieces of that economic puzzle. Why do we concentrate on these more important releases? And ultimately, it's because of one word, and that's volatility. We know all eyes are on the data, and the data will be interpreted in a heartbeat, and prices will react. And when prices react and move, that in turn is going to entice increased activity. And as we often say at FX Pacer, volatility equals opportunity. So let's take a look at the economic calendar for this week. For the sake of time, I've highlighted just a handful of three-star data that will be at the forefront of my mind as a trader. So today's calendar is very uneventful. However, in the early hours of tomorrow morning, so 4.30 a.m. East Africa time, we have meeting minutes from the RBA, so the Royal Bank of Australia. The minutes are a detailed record of the committee's policy setting meeting. So the minutes are going to offer a detailed insight into the RBA's stance on the Australian economy. And consequently, traders will examine these minutes for clues on any future central bank action. We're going to look for key words, key phrases, indications, etc. So, for example, the RBA are expected to remain dovish for the foreseeable future. Therefore, if there's a, a mildly hawkish tone, um, that would really fuel a bid under the Australian dollar. As huge trading partners to China, the strongly correlated Australian dollar has suffered more than most currencies due to the impact of this coronavirus. Just in March, we saw the Australian dollar fall to multi-year lows, particularly against that true safe haven US dollar. However, economic data out of Australia has painted a slightly brighter picture of late, <clears throat> excuse me, and we now enter a very pivotal time for the commodity dependent currency. An uptick in positive data, it seemed inevitable from those historical lows, but can it now be sustained and built on? Is it a true V-shaped recovery from those mid to late March lows? So Euro Oz, Aussie Yen, Aussie Dollar, Sterling Oz, all very popular FX pairs amongst our existing clientele. So Euro against the Australian Dollar, the Australian Dollar against the Japanese Yen, the Australian Dollar versus the US Dollar, and of course the Great British Pound versus the Australian dollar. So moving on to Wednesday, we have crude oil inventories at 5.30 p.m. EAT. And that, of course, is going to have a huge impact on the prices of oil. The oil and gas sector have dominated the headlines over the past few months, and rightly so. For the first time in history, we saw WTI futures set, settle at a negative value. So essentially, owners of oil contracts were paying to offload their assets prior to physical delivery. So a quite astonishing market dynamic. Currently hovering just north of, north of the $40 handle, WTI traders will be eager to see the current state of supply. Hampered by limited travel and social lockdowns across the globe, oil demand has been crushed throughout this global pandemic. So the data is released by the EIA, so the Energy Information Administration. And it measures the weekly change in the number of oil barrels held by US firms. So a decrease of 2.098 million barrels week on week is the forecast. So a build in inventories, for example, an additional 2 million barrels week on week would indicate weaker demand and potentially oversupply. And that would be bearish for oil prices. A greater than forecast draw or decline in recorded inventories would be bullish for the price of oil. So keep a very close eye on the price of WTI and Brent this week. We're now trading at key resistance, the WTI spot contract. We've, we've closed that March, that March gap. Um, and the recovery over the past couple of months has been very sharp. However, that rally appears to be now running out of steam. So we're, again, we're coming to a, a key period in that pivotal market. And poor inventories data could really fuel the fire 
for oil bears. And it's a brilliant risk to reward trade for any short positions. We've now got a clear line in the sand above that $42 handle. Thursday brings more three-side data out of America in the form of initial jobless claims. And in my opinion, data out of America carries such great importance. The, the success of the US economy is essential for the growth of the global economy. The US is the largest and most influential trading partner in the world. So broadly put, when the US economy struggles, the world economy will tend to struggle and vice versa. And for this reason, I believe it's imperative to track economic data out of America regardless of what product or what trade, uh, what symbol you're trading. So. Initial jobless claims also carries great importance due to the weekly nature of the release versus that more common monthly release, such as the non-farm payroll or NFP, as it's more commonly known. It's going to give us a more recent outlook on the health of the US economy. The US is a very consumer-driven economy. Labor market health and wage gains will have a direct impact on consumer market health. So if we get less jobless claims, that's going to indicate more people in jobs, higher income across the board, higher consumer spending, higher corporate revenue, higher capacity to employ, etc. It's a domino effect, all correlated in some way. And confident consumers with a steady income are going to spend more money on things they need, services they like, or perhaps even luxuries that they can't resist. And that's what's going to fuel the broader economy. As a trader and analyst, the key question for me is how many of the temporary layoffs will become permanent job losses over time? So many of the people who were laid off in March and April, they perhaps considered their furlough short term and they did not look for a new position and hence they were not counted in the unemployment rate. Depending on your geographical location, shutdowns are stretching into their fourth and fifth month and I believe a portion of these furloughed employees are going to start and begin to look for new work and thus they will join the official unemployment rate. I believe there will have been a large chunk of companies that turned to furlough payments as an immediate reaction. This coronavirus was very unknown, a very scary and complex situation. Organizations will have granted furlough as a knee-jerk reaction and it was a knee-jerk reaction made by many. Plan A is never to burn bridges and lose those skilled and loyal workers companies will have been keen to see how this situation played out. I think it's fair to say that the extent of economic damage has been far greater than that initial consensus predicted in March. And companies will now be feeling the strain more than ever. For example, we've seen multi-billion dollar companies such as Hertz file for bankruptcy in recent weeks. So I'm of the opinion that many of the initial furloughs will gradually turn into redundancies as time continues to pass with these social restrictions across the globe. And that will eventually be reflected in employment data, such as initial jobless claims. So let's see if Thursday's data is going to show any further reflection of a slowing labor market stateside. The forecast is 1.3 million initial jobless claims for the previous week, and the data is released at 3.30 p.m. EAT. Finally, on Friday, the economic calendar is dominated by data out of the UK, and most notably for me, retail sales data and that comes at 9 a.m eat the reading will reflect the change in the aggregate value of retail sales across the uk for the month of june a very important indicator as consumer spending accounts for the majority of economic activity so a forecast change of plus 8.5 percent so a reading greater than that 8.5 is going to be bullish for the pound and vice versa we're also in the middle of what's known as earnings season. So a few weeks post quarter where major companies will disclose their quarterly or halfly performance. So it's a huge week this week in regard to company earnings. We have Microsoft and Tesla on Wednesday post market and then Twitter pre market on Thursday. So following last week's well publicized hacking of those very influential Twitter accounts, the social media platform remains firmly in the spotlight for the trading week ahead. And all three companies are part of the NASDAQ 100, an index that is compromised of 100 US-based companies from a broad range of sectors, excluding the financial sector. So no banks, investment companies, etc. Guided by outperforming Tesla and Amazon, the NASDAQ has really led the charge in the global stock market recovery. Quite astonishing, but we've recently posted fresh all-time highs. Having retraced from that slightly, 
the tech index will be at the forefront of this week's earnings. Despite having an opinion on all of the mentioned markets, as I always say, I'm not married to the bias. I'm going to let the data make my decision for me. Once the data is released, I'm going to assess the numbers with a neutral perception and formulate a trade idea from there. I'm a technical analyst, so I'm always going to let price action formulate my opinion. I'm going to watch how the markets react to the data. I'm going to evaluate what price action is telling me about how the data is being perceived by the majority. The financial markets reflect this constant tug of war between both buyers and sellers. And economic data is watched by all traders, and it's going to determine the motivation level of both bulls and bears. So a chart at the forefront of my concentration this week. Let's pull it onto the screen there. So this is a euro dollar chart, so euro against the US dollar. And as the dust continues to settle somewhat and demand for that safe haven dollar has faded, euro dollar has enjoyed a fairly one directional rally from that 109 region up to that 114. However, we're still well within the yearly 2020 range. So I currently hold a short bias. I'm anticipating and waiting for a setup for the euro to weaken against the dollar over the coming days. I believe even those euro bulls will be keen to take profit at these pivotal levels. And at a minimum, I anticipate a retracement and retest of these lagging moving averages highlighted on the chart here. So again, an excellent risk versus reward trade to be short euro dollar at the top end of the yearly range. And Thursday's jobless claims are going to create volatility in the popular cross. So a strong reading for the dollar is really going to provide emphasis for those currently contained bears. When interpreting data as it's released, it's imperative to understand that the markets are going to react against that forecast figure. Always be conscious of that forecast. The markets will not react to previous results, previous month or year. The data will be judged against expectations. If there are any major surprises or disappointments that deviate from expectations, the markets will react to this new reality by adjusting their prices and adjusting their exchange rates. You can find all of the upcoming data on our research and tools tab here. It has the forecast, the data as, it, as it's released, a countdown. Um, so make sure to utilize that tool. That's all from me. Have a great week. And good luck to all Genghis and FX Pacer clients. Please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter with any comments or questions. My Twitter handle is at equity underscore Mark, equity with an I and Mark with a K. Thank you again for joining, and I hope that you join again soon next week. Please, again, please send any feedback or anything you'd, you'd like us to touch on in the webinars. Stay safe. Thank you.